All right, well, this next, uh, this next person is uh, our, my co-founder. So this is Elizabeth Wanning. Hi, Elizabeth. Hey, Ken, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you and see you. Just great, you look beautiful. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Look at this awesome. Look at this awesome cup that I found in the in the break room. <laughs> well, this is a blast from the past. That is a blast from the past. That's Ken. <laughs> That's me. Is that Jess next to you? Or no, is this is the Moral Revolution team when we first got in, got on board. I love it. 2018. 2018. Well, I've I told them a little brief history of us, so they they're up to speed with what you're talking about. Um, all right, well, y'all get to have Bible time with Elizabeth, theologian Elizabeth now. So you're going to enjoy this. You ready, Elizabeth? I'm ready. Um, okay. I'm going to attempt to. Sam, I hope I can share my screen. No. So I just need you to turn on sharing for me. Mm, well, while I'm waiting for that to happen, um, it's a pleasure to get to see you. I can kind of see some of you. It's a little bit of a strange dynamic to do a Zoom presentation like this while the rest of the team is on site, but um, I'm really grateful to be able to join you today and to, um, to do my best to bring you into a little bit of the perspective that we have on, um, on the Bible because and Sam, I see, I see that I've got sharing rights, so I'm just going to talk for a minute. So one of the, um, I'm sure that as a congregation, even as families, you have looked at scripture and grappled with what does it say and what does it mean? And, you know, my story is that uh, I came out in my early 20s, but I loved theology. And so I, I continued in the church, so unlike Ken, Ken, as he, I don't know how much of his story was sharing, but as he grew up, he grew up within a conservative church environment and kind of stayed quiet about his struggle until he just couldn't any longer. Um, I was, I grew up in a more progressive denomination, a more liberal expression of Christianity. And so when I came out, um, although there was controversy and there was pain, it wasn't the same as what Ken experienced. So I, I kind of moved on into um, a gay affirming uh, environment within my denomination. And so ultimately I went to seminary openly lesbian. And it wasn't until I graduated from seminary and entered parish ministry that I was exposed to charismatic Christianity. And through a through a pastor was connected to a youth ministry and was invited to an evening, um, an evening time of worship. And, uh, you know, I was just, I was doing youth ministry myself, just a new grad. And so I was very curious about this ministry. Um, this was in a very small rural community, about 5,000 people, but they had a huge ministry for a community that size. Um, they had, 40 or 50 kids sometimes showing up. And so I was curious what was going on there. And so one evening I went to this, this gathering and um, the Holy Spirit flooded the place in power. Now, I, ha I had never seen anything like that before. It was completely out of the box. And honestly, it was a little bit frightening. Like, I love to always say when I'm sharing my story that it was um, a Presbyterian's worst nightmare. I mean, it was children weeping, running around, people were falling on the ground. Like, I was a dignified hymn singing Presbyterian, and this was completely outside of my box. And in that setting, a 17 year old boy approached me with what he called a word from the Lord. And um, at that point in my life, I didn't know. And, and this, so in my entire experience of Christianity, I had never met anyone who claimed that they heard directly from the Lord. And none of my pastor friends would have believed it. 
<laughs> but this young man approached me with a, what he called a, a word from the Lord, this prophetic word, and he read my mail. And he proceeded to tell me something um, about my life, something I had been praying about for years. Now, that experience didn't convict me of sin. Instead, it convicted me that perhaps I didn't know who God really is. And so that set me forth. I mean, it just pushed me into this trajectory of searching for God. And it began with um, a Bible. That was the only safe space that I knew of. Um, I began rereading scripture, just pouring through scripture. And I began highlighting every place in scripture where God describes himself um, or where he is explicitly identified. And I began to get this incredible vision, this incredible view of who God is and who Jesus is. And I, it, it, it completely and radically changed my life. Um, to, to make the long story short, ultimately, I began questioning my sexuality. That, that is, I began questioning lesbianism in my life because I saw in scripture that lesbianism was not represented. And I began to see that um, it, it and my embrace of queer theology was unraveling. Um, and, and so ultimately I repented. I desired so deeply to be connected and in unity with the God that was being revealed to me. Well, ultimately I married my husband. We've been married for 18 years. And I've been on this journey to see the Lord since that very first time, almost 25 years ago. And I, although we could spend a lot of time talking about moments of inner healing or um, self-discoveries that I've made about my life story or about my family and, and things I've believed, nothing in my life has been as transformative as my journey to see the Lord clearly and experience his presence. And so I want to encourage you that that alone, just hinted at it, the, the, the longing to see Jesus, pushing people towards Jesus, coming together to worship Jesus, to experience his presence, to see him clearly as he is, is the most important thing that you can offer to everyone that you know, but especially people who have been impacted by LGBT. And so as, you know, it's, it's easy to listen to conversations or talks on the Bible about this topic, and they might pick out a handful of scriptures they call the clobber passages. You know, these are scripture verses from maybe Exodus or Leviticus or, or Romans or Timothy. Um, but looking at scripture and isolating what scripture says about human identity to these do not do this passages is misleading because the whole of scripture says a great deal about human identity and human sexuality. And it, it undeniably exalts male, female relationship, sexual relationship and marriage. Um, but one of my pet peeves as people look at scripture is the tendency to diminish what Jesus says and does in favor of what Moses says or what Paul says. If we believe that Jesus is God and that the gospels rightly express his teaching, then it's absolutely paramount that we restore his primacy in talking about our sexuality. And so, I'm going to point you to a few places um, in the hope that I can be done by 1130 um, for you to begin to ponder and think about who Jesus is and how important it is that we align with what he thought. How did he live his own life? How did he think about his own sexuality? He was a man. He did grapple with what it meant to be a man. And he very clearly in scripture articulates what his own thinking was about sex. And so let's take a look at that.
I like to call this topic Jesus's own sexual ethic or, you know, this series of slides just focusing on Jesus himself. So what I as we get started, this is um this is a portrait of Jesus by Renoir. I want us to just center ourselves on Jesus. What have you experienced of Jesus? How do you know him? How does he interact with you? What has he taught you? Why do you live the way you do in association with him? These are the key questions that we have to begin to ask and learn how to articulate when we're talking to people who are questioning their identity. Because Jesus is the identity maker. He has come to restore our human identity. N.T. Wright would say that Jesus was the only and the first truly human person. So I just want to start by, you know, when we talk about sexual behavior, like just pointed out, homosexuality in scripture is always and only a behavior. Scripture doesn't in any way isolate different, uh, different types of people, as in um, here's a blind person, their identity is blindness. Or here's a greedy person, they are greedy. Um, there's no label like, um, how, how would I describe this? You know, there's no, al there's no label like alcoholism and you're always an alcoholic in scripture. No, in scripture, we are all just simply men and women. And so when we're talking about Christian behavior, what is the foundation of Christian morality? Often when I ask this, people will say, well, the Bible is. But really, we need to be much more explicit. God himself is the foundation of Christian morality. And so what do we know about God? If God is the model and the progenitor of everything that is right and good, in the world, all human behavior, everything that we think of that is pure and excellent about human behavior has first been given through God and speaks to God's own character. Um, we have to get away from looking at scripture as a rule book and start to see God as he is. Because as many Christians have noted, what you worship, you become what you observe, you become. So the strict gaze on who God is and his character and his ways is transformative. Here's what Wayne Grudem says. Well, let's see here, my little slide is, my picture is covering up part of my slide. Okay, so Wayne Grudem is a well-known um, systematic theologian, evangelical theologian. This is what he says. The ultimate standard of right, morality, is the character or nature of God. The basis of Christian ethics is that God is what he is, and so we must be conformed to what he is in holiness, righteousness, truth, goodness, and love. God made man in his own image and after his likeness. Man must therefore be like God. And of course, even in, even in the Gospels, Jesus makes the demand, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so to truly, in order to truly see what it means to be human, we have to have a vision of who God is. And praise the Lord that Jesus came to show us um, what God is like. Let's see if I can get to the next slide. In John, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Isn't that profound? 
how many times when we read the Gospels do we think, wow, as I am imagining Jesus ministering to people, healing people, or teaching from the Sermon on the Mount, I could be, I could think of myself as Moses on Mount Sinai, seeing God, hearing directly from God. In fact, Matthew kind of makes that direct correlation if you study out the ways Exodus is uh, pointed to in the book of Matthew. And so observing Jesus in the Gospels is, it is so important. It is unbelievably important. And it is so, it's such a beautiful, such a beautiful practice to sit down, take a passage where Jesus is teaching, and imagine yourself sitting among the crowd. Maybe you can feel the wind on your face. You can maybe smell the water. You might be able to smell the fish. You can feel the rocks that you're sitting on and you're listening to God. You're seeing God himself. So like I said already, we've got to begin to prioritize Jesus. Here's a scripture verse for you. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. And so part of the gift given to us through Jesus' death, his salvation offered to us, is that we're born again. Um, we are made new. Jesus is on this incredible restoration journey with us to restore the image of God on us in our lives. And so one of the key factors for all of us at Changed is, are you born again? And what does it mean to be born again? And part of that is leaving the old behind, leaving the old cultural stereotypes, leaving the LGBT labels, leaving even our habits, our, our self-understanding, and embracing instead what God teaches us. What does he tell us about ourselves? What is God saying? that we are or who does God say that we are all of us should be searching for God's specific vision for our own lives and through the Holy Spirit we can begin to access that we can ask the Lord show me what is the most excellent version of my life how do you see me Lord and we can turn to those who are around us like maybe you're discipling someone you can offer them, just mention words of affirmation. You can offer them that vision. <laughs> this is how God sees you. This is who you are in Christ. You are not addicted to porn. That is not your ultimate destiny. Your ultimate destiny is the pure heartedness of Jesus. What is Jesus like that we are beginning to experience in our own lives? And, you know, maybe this feels like a tall order, but in fact, the apostles all understood and appreciated that being with Jesus in his presence um, transformed their lives. And John even goes so far in 1 John to express that you know a Christian by how they manifest Christ. Like, if, if you are not um, carrying the humility and the generosity and the compassion and the tenderness of Jesus, and if you're not living in the purity of heart and the concern for others, the first command, worshiping God purely and loving your neighbors purely, then you should question, do they know the Lord? Here's what 1 John says, by this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. We mustn't think that because 
you know, some some Christian doctrines say his righteousness is merely imputed to us, that we never fully experience his life or we never can fully experience his redemption. But yet, how much of that sells short what Jesus did as a sacrifice on the cross? We've got to hold that tension of being in the now, in the transition between the old creation and the new. And we've got to, kind of like Bill Johnson will say, we've got to see what heaven is like and set our minds towards experiencing all that God will give us from from that kingdom orientation. So what, what about Jesus's own sexuality? And this is where I might get a little provocative for you. You know, we, we can very easily see how Jesus's own inner life was manifest. So when Jesus, I don't, I don't know if any of you have ever done a, a preaching moment, um, but I know that you're aware that your own pastor, when he preaches, he's preaching from what God is saying to him in the moment. And he's telling you what the Lord has delivered to him. And we have to think of Jesus as that way. Jesus is teaching from his own life experience. He's not disconnected from the commands that he teaches about. He actually lived the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, I would say, I would go so far as to say that, you know, so many theologians will look at um, the Sermon on the Mount and say, well, this is a standard that cannot be met by humanity. Therefore, you know, this is the Holy Spirit, in what he imputes to us. Um, but I want to recommend that Jesus is mainly talking about his own life. He's talking about the promise of the kingdom of God. What is life like for the one who walks according to the ways of God? And so Jesus is describing in the Sermon on the Mount, although he says, you do this, he's describing the way he lived life. And so what, what do we know about Jesus' own sexuality? Well, for starters, we know that he was unmarried and he was waiting on his spouse. Obviously, we could get into the bridal paradigm and Jesus' own references to marriage um, are twofold. They have a spiritual dynamic and they also have a practical dynamic. But Jesus stewarded his sexuality as a single man and many of his disciples never married. Um, we have examples like Mary and Lazarus and Martha and Paul and others in the New Testament who were never married. And yet sexual purity, so not having sex, sexual chastity was a very, very high demand on the New Testament church. In fact, I would say that the sexual ethic of the early church largely set Christians apart in the first and second centuries from the rest of culture. Yeah. It was a dynamic and really freeing experience for the early disciples to recognize the purity of marriage as a manifestation of the blessings of God and of the character of God, but also to walk out the purity of singleness before God as a true call to stewarding life as a Christian within the congregational family. So, Jesus lived according to the sexual ethic that's described in the Mosaic Law, and he invited people to live that way as well. So in Matthew 5, I'm just kind of scoot through this. He, he says, I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill the law. And he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. And so where Jesus talks about sex and sexual behavior, he never abrogates the law. That is, he never lowers the standard of behavior. In fact, he makes it tighter. He makes it tighter. He was so concerned about the heart and sexual behavior. So I've already kind of said this, his pure heartedness is revealed. And, but yet, he rejected legalism. 
Jesus's teachings on sex and sexual behavior all focus um, the priority on the pure heartedness of the individuals. And you see in the Sermon on the Mount that he never, um, he never objectifies any of the subjects that he teaches about. Jesus had a very, very high relational ethic, not just on sexuality, and he prioritized worth, the value of the people that he was talking to in everything that he did. God has other-centered love. Yeah, so love is an expression of worth. You know, I often hear people say, well, what about the LGBT community? You just love them, right? You just love them. Well, okay. If love is an expression of worth, how are you going to love them? How are you going to let them know that you value them? that you have empathy for their lives, that you are concerned about their well-being, that you want them to belong, you want them in your family even. The great command. So the great command in the gospel, to love God with all your heart and then to love your neighbor as yourself is expressed over and over and over in Jesus' teachings and it's carried forward through the apostles. Like here's what Paul says. This is Paul's reiteration of Jesus' teaching about the first command. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Now, the, the key thing that I want you to see here is the sense of value for the other person. It isn't just you shall not or love is self-sacrificial, but it's that you're assigning a value for that other person and your value for that other person is what restricts you from murdering, committing adultery, stealing, coveting. And so we have to get to the point where we truly see one another. We see, like Pastor Bill will say, we see that other person like the Lord sees them. And then we hold that value in our hearts as we interact. It's such a powerful and necessary response that the church needs to have. Because if we just simply say, hey, stop it. I don't know if any of you are old enough to know the Bob Newhart um, skit where this the psychiatrist is meeting with a client and the client comes in and pours her heart out to him and his response is the psychiatry, psychiatrist is, oh, I can help you, stop it, <laughs> just stop it. Well, we can't really do that. We've got to understand, we've got to get deep, we've got to connect, and we've got to respond with the love of Christ for the people that we're meeting. Well, so then the next huge factor for all of us is that sexual behavior for Jesus is an expression of love made within the context of a marriage covenant. Now, this is kind of an extraordinary shift in culture, you know, um, Marriage has served throughout history as a, as a means of connecting families and, and even connecting nations and creating covenantal political um, connections among people or families and tribes and nations. Um, but Jesus begins to allow us to locate marriage in the space of love. And I won't have time to really develop it in this, in this talk, but um, when he starts to talk about marriage, he starts to show how the love of God for humanity is emulated in marriage. And so Jesus teach that, teaches that sexual thoughts and behaviors outside of marriage cause harm. Now, isn't that interesting? Let that sink in. Here's, here's his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. 
You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, we, as, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, the first thing that we have to think about here is that Jesus regarded his own imagination as reality. Now, and that makes sense. I mean, Jesus is God. So what he thought about was creative. But that also means that Jesus says, what we think about has power. And it already has action when we're thinking about it. That is so frightening, honestly, um, that Jesus would demand that we scrutinize even what we think. Now, we tend to, at Changed, we know what it's like to have a besetting sin. And we know not to assign identity to that besetting sin. And we also know that the blood of Jesus frees us from or absolves us from the actions that we take. That he, his salvation is enough when I turn and look at porn or when I go and get a, get a hookup that Jesus's blood is enough to, to save us. But Jesus invites us through his life to a life where we even have purity in our thought life. So in that passage, we saw that Jesus regarded lust. Um, so lust completely devalues another person. So if you're lusting after another person, then you're objectifying them. You're removing all of their value as a person so that you can consume them for your personal gratification. Um, he regards that act with as much gravity as, some, as physical violence. And so he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. So, you know, I think we gloss over the gravity of his teaching, but he is, he is correlating our thought life as something that is truly real, truly actionable, and something that life, that his own life frees us from. And we see because of that demand, Jesus is concerned about our hearts. And of course, we know, like if you go back into the Old Testament, so you look at Ezekiel, you'll see that God said, God promises, I'll give you a new heart, a new heart that obeys me. Well, that's precisely what Jesus sets himself toward. And so a lot of his teaching is talking about what is, what is the heart condition that leads to lust? And what is the integrity that we need to have to live as a disciple? And so, for example, in Mark 7, Jesus explicitly points out sexual immorality as a matter of the heart, not, not just a matter of the body, if you will, or some sexual impulse. Um, so he says, what comes out of a person is what defiles him, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, which in this passage is connected to lust. Um, I'll let you kind of take that in. Coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, which sensuality is kind of in this, in this passage, um, promiscuity or unbridled sexual behavior, and even foolishness. So foolishness in this passage has the connotation of like godlessness, of lack of respect for what's sacred. So all of these attitudes that have real behaviors behind them are a matter of the heart. But then this, this is also, I mean, for our generation, understanding Jesus's perspective on marriage is perhaps the, the most mind blowing, as if all of these other things weren't mind blowing. And, and I wanna point out, so as I say this, I'm talking about marriage and sexual expression within the context of marriage, not because marriage is the most important thing about human sexuality, but because it is the location for human expression of sexuality. And it's easy to prioritize, hey, 
you know, you should get married. If, if you're single, you, you have a partner, you have a life partner. You know, your goal in, as a Christian is to get married and have a family. Well, that's not entirely biblical. That's not entirely biblical. There are so many single people in the New Testament, and I'll touch on that in a second. So, let's see. Jesus says, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Now, I don't want to go too deep into the issue of divorce, because later in Matthew 19, Jesus is firmly against no-fault divorce, and he also shows great compassion for the victims of divorce. He's very concerned about the people who are really impacted directly from the objectification that I was talking about when we use one another for personal satisfaction and the implications of that. But here's the thing that I want you to see in this passage. The factor of being married one time and sex being located in marriage. So Jesus saw sexual expression as a want, you had one sexual partner for your entire life. Want complete faithfulness in marriage to one person, complete loyalty. And throughout scripture, even if you go back into the early parts of, of, the, of the Old Testament, sex is always associated as um, either the initiation of marriage, like when you get married, the consummation of your marriage occurs when you have sex, or the covenant that happens as a result of the union that happens between a man and a woman. And, and in our culture, um, we don't even think about that. I mean, if you watch a movie, the first thing we do in, in the movie, a romance is we have sex. And then after having sex, we kind of work out the details of our relationship and hope that it works out. But Jesus has such a strict view of marriage and part of it has to do with his belief that marriage points, it, it points to something much greater than human relationship. And because of time, I'm not going to go too deep on this, but I just want you, if you would read through Matthew 19, you'll see that his disciples were stunned. Like they respond to Jesus' teaching here by saying, well, if this is the case, no one should get married. Um, because Jesus basically says male and female were created for relationship together and that um, you that divorce in the kingdom of God is non-existent. God does not um, enable or empower divorce. Now, why would he do that? It, it's because for God, marriage is emblematic of his life with humanity. It points to how we manifest to the whole world the relationship of God to us, the commitment of God to us, even for Jesus, his intimate connection with us and his commitment, his loyalty to be with us forever. Just going to gloss over this. But while Jesus calls everybody to this higher standard, he also displays this very, very deep humility, this way of drawing people into his redemption. And so he, you'll see that he saw people and cherished them. And, you know, that affirmation of being desired, of being wanted, I mean, personally, it was intoxicating for me as I first began to see who God was and experience in those early years what seemed like his pursuit of me. And so Jesus's value for people is what draws them into his way of life. So we're all familiar, and I'll close with this, with this passage from John 8 where the woman is caught in adultery. Let me just read this to you. Jesus 
stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And Jesus stood up and said, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and from now on, sin no more. Now, you know, it's easy to use this passage and say, hey, stop it. Stop sinning. Stop doing what you're doing. And, and think that that's precisely what Jesus was doing. But I want to draw you into something a little deeper here. When the woman was caught in adultery, that was probably, well, undeniably, the most humiliating experience of her life. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced that level of shame. And maybe, maybe you can identify with this if you think of what would it be like for a pastor to be caught in an adultery? What, what would be the response to him? Would he be redeemed? Likely, we would expect him to forever leave ministry, to forever be ostracized, to forever be untrustworthy. We would probably throw stones at him. We would cast him out of our community. We would demand that he sacrifice and likely leave everything. And maybe you have that kind of experience in your life. Maybe like me or some, some of the rest of us on the change team, you have been, um, you've been called out or you, you maybe you've been outed if you have LGBT in your life. And the shame and the humiliation of that moment is terrifying. And Jesus, it says Jesus stood up and said to her, Jesus stood with the woman in her most humiliating moment. The moment where she was being faced with not just death, but public exposure. She's now losing her whole family. Um, she'll be ostracized. She'll be cast out of the temple. She'll never be able to worship the Lord in the temple among her family. Um, she is now on the outside and there's no, in Israeli culture, there's no, uh, there's no redemption available. So she is out. And Jesus stands and says, I don't condemn you. So he, he's exercising what I've been describing. He's seeing her. He sees her. He sees the situation around her adultery. She may, he maybe sees the victimization. He maybe sees, like the woman at the well, he sees her longing to be loved or to be cherished by someone or Maybe he sees her need to, to make money to support her life. Like maybe she's a woman of the night. Jesus sees and knows all of that. And, and looks at her and says, I don't condemn you for that. All of us that changed have experienced that. And maybe you have experienced that. Where you've repented, where you've confessed You've come face to face with the dynamic of your utter failure and your utter shame. And Jesus didn't kick you to the curb. Here, Jesus doesn't condemn her. And when he says, go from now on, sin no more, where could she do that? The only place she could do that now is in his fellowship. He's inviting her to become a disciple, part of his community, to come alongside. He's not, he's not pushing her away and so go, go on your own way and make your own life because she couldn't have been able to do that. So whenever you are ministering to somebody who has this level of shame and the potential of complete loss, I want to invite you to think about this passage and think, how can I 
bring this person closer to the Lord? How can I help them find this space in Jesus's fellowship? How can I facilitate a way for Jesus to connect with this person so they experience the redemption of his acceptance? And there's a whole lot I could say about Jesus's own singleness, about the way that he cultivated family and friendship around him, and he encouraged singles in his midst to have family within the congregation, if you will, to steward the lives of those with whom they are surrounded. Um, Jesus has so much to say about the way we steward our sexual behaviors, but so much more to say about how we cherish one another. And so I'll stop right there, oh, seven minutes over, but hopefully you can kind of get your lunch and enjoy and fellowship under the first command here at noon. Um, Ken, are you still there? I'm still here. Thank All you right. so much. That was beautiful as always. I wonder if you could pray for everybody as a, it's a little hard for me to pray from over here in Zoom land. Yeah, did you say you wanted me to pray? There's yeah. That. Okay, all right. Yeah, Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth to us. We thank you, Lord, um, for Elizabeth's ability to help us see through a lens that culture isn't recommending that we see from, but Lord, to look at kind of the, the whole of what you've told us, Lord, and to understand. I pray, Lord, that we would capture in our hearts uh, the notion of um, walking with you in, in righteousness and integrity and, and not ever um, harming another person, even just by our thoughts. Um, Lord, help us examine our own lives, whether or not the LGBTQ issue has been a challenge, but to, to examine, Lord, are, am I honoring the way that you honor? Um, give us the grace for that. And uh, Lord, just bless all of us. Bless the food as we go. And uh, bless Elizabeth for sharing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks, we'll everybody. We'll see you back at the ranch later. Okay. Okay, bye.